Hello, welcome to this uh, presentation on inside cancer. I'm Professor Lawrence Hurst at the University of Bath. I'm an evolutionary geneticist. And today I'm going to give a quick presentation about a subject which at first sight looks pretty straightforward. What is a gene? When I say at first sight it looks fairly straightforward because most people know that a gene is a bit of DNA and is a bit of DNA that codes for protein. Most of our body is protein. Most of our muscle is protein, for example. And to unpick that a bit, if we were to go into any of your cells in your body, you'll find 46 chromosomes, 23 that you got from your mum, 23 from your dad. And if we unravel those chromosomes, we'll find a big long string of DNA, one string of DNA per chromosome. And there'll be small segments of this, which are our genes, the bit that code for protein. Again, we can ask, how do they do that exactly? Well, the DNA is transcribed. That's a process in which a copy of the DNA is taken, but it's a single-strand copy that we call RNA. This RNA, which we call messenger RNA, because it's really just the messenger conveying the information from the DNA, then moves to a cellular machine called the ribosome, and along with transfer RNAs, then produce the final protein. So the sequence of information that we have on the DNA becomes a matched sequence of information in the RNA that is translated, just as you translate the Morse code, for example, into protein. Those rules for translation are the genetic code rather than the Morse code, but it's exactly the same principle. Encoded in one lot of information, decoded to another, the decode is the protein. So there we have the idea of what a gene is. It's simply a bit of DNA that gets transcribed. The transcript gets translated into protein. Maybe that's all there is to it. But hold on. There are still, even here with this simple idea, some complexities. Let me ask this simple question. Where exactly does the gene start and where exactly does it stop? Because if we look at those transcripts, those RNAs, it's not all protein coding. Even in the simplest case, we look in bacteria, for example. Even in the simplest case, you will find that while the protein coding information starts a little way into the gene with, as shown here, an ATG, that's the information that codes for a methionine amino acid, which starts proteins. Then you have the rest of the protein coding information, and you have a bit of uh, RNA after that. So you have these blocks of untranslated RNA both before and after the protein coding segment. And these we call the five prime untranslated regions and the three prime untranslated regions. Five prime is the front end, three prime is the back end. So maybe our gene starts from where the untranslated regions start and the untranslated region stops at the other end. But a gene, this transcript encoding part of DNA, can't do its work on its own. It needs information as to when to be transcribed and how to be transcribed. And that is encoded often by information on the DNA just a little bit upstream of the gene in things called promoter elements. So are the promoters part of the gene? And if promoters are part of a gene, well, what about things that are very much more distant? So we also know about bits of DNA that we call enhancer elements. And these can be very far from where the focal part actually is. And these we don't usually consider as parts of the gene at all, but they are very important in the control of the gene. We then meet some further complexities. So in the simple case I just showed you, we had the idea that there's one bit of DNA which makes one transcript, one RNA, which will make one protein. For our genome, for our genes, of which there are 20 to 25,000 or so, there are in fact multiple different versions of the same protein made from any given transcript. And this is because most of our genes undergo a further process, a process known as splicing, in which parts of the RNA are taken out. As you can see in this particular example, one transcript can have different parts taken out under different circumstances. These then are known as alternative splice forms or alternative transcripts. And these also give us a bit of a headache when we want to think about what a gene actually is. Do we want to regard these as three different versions of the same gene or three different genes? To some extent, it's up to you. 
Perhaps, however, the more important problem that we now face when we think about genes is another challenge. So, so far we've assumed that a gene is a bit of DNA that gets transcribed and that transcript gets translated into protein. But what if you had something, a bit of DNA, that got transcribed but the transcript was not translated? Do we see these? The answer is yes, we've met some already. Transfer RNAs are in fact one such so-called non-coding RNA. In fact, it now turns out that a huge amount of our genome is in fact transcribed, making an RNA, but that RNA is not translated. Like uh, our protein coding genes, these non-coding genes are also typically spliced. Not all of them, but many of them are spliced as well. By definition, however, these non-coding RNAs are not translated, and that's of course why we call them non-coding RNAs. They come in very many flavors, tRNAs, as we've already mentioned. Ribosomal RNAs are part of that ribosomal translational machinery. But two of particular interest at the moment are microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs. Both of these appear to have some relevance to cancer, particularly microRNAs, as these seem to be involved in the regulation of protein coding genes, amongst other things. What's particularly interesting about these things, however, is that over the last 10 years or so, it has become clear that these are not minor players in our genome, but this is actually the bulk of transcript. So 2% or so of our genome is protein coding, but maybe 70 to 80% is transcribed. Those other things getting transcribed are these non-coding RNAs. So they are the bulk of our transcripts. Go into any one of our cells, sequence up those transcripts, most of them will be non-coding. So let's return to our question, what is a gene? It's not so clear anymore. But you can also ask, why does this matter? Am I just belly aching about nothing? Well, to some extent, perhaps we are. But we also have a challenge. And the challenge is this. We can now very simply find the sequence of nucleotides that makes up DNA in any gen genome that we so desire. This is now cheap and relatively easy to do. What we need to do, however, is not just have a series of nucleotides, the string of nucleotides that make up DNA. We want to know whether the bits are that are important. And that means we need to be able to annotate a genome. And to annotate, we need to say here is where a gene starts, here's where a gene ends. So we need to have an understanding of what a gene is to be able to do this, to be able to hone in on what the important parts are within genomes and what they might be able to do. And of course, what we can do unambiguously is define transcripts, and this is often our route in. So because we can define transcripts, we can sequence up all the RNAs within a cell. What you can then do is say, okay, where did those RNAs come from on the DNA? So we can map the transcripts back onto the DNA, back onto the genomes. But we're still left with a problem. Imagine you have two transcripts, different transcripts, and they map back to the same bit of DNA. This we find quite regularly. Is that evidence of two genes or one gene? We need to be able to decide. But nonetheless, leaving these issues aside, we can sort of get a rough idea, a goodish definition of what a gene must be. So what about this? A gene is a stretch of DNA, maybe the associated close control elements, maybe the promoters, but the gene can be transcribed, possibly spliced, and possibly translated. That sort of does us, doesn't it? That'll be okay. So virologists in the audience will know we have a problem already, and that's because there are a lot of viruses that don't use DNA as their uh, inherited material. They use RNAs, sometimes single-stranded, sometimes double-stranded RNA. They function just like anything else. Those RNAs encode the information for proteins and so on and so forth. So let's go again. What about a gene is a stretch of polynucleic acid, that could be DNA or RNA, Perhaps the associated control elements, if we want to put those in. But the point is, we get something that's transcribed, maybe spliced, maybe translated. OK. It's a sort of OK understanding of a gene. It's a lot looser than what we started out with, with a bit of DNA, which makes a protein. But nonetheless, it'll do. But now, we meet an interesting problem. And the problem is this. People were talking about genes long before we knew any of that stuff that I was telling you about. 
Before we knew about chromosomes, DNA, transcription, translation, we were talking about genes. How could we have done that? Isn't that a bit of a problem? The answer is, it's a bit of a problem, but let's see why people were talking about genes and how that helps us understand what a gene might be. So to understand why people were talking about genes before, we have to go back to about 1900. In 1900, people had rediscovered Mendel's work. Sir so Gregor Mendel, famous plant breeder, discovered the rules of inheritance. And what he discovered was something quite striking. Inheritance didn't work like people thought it worked before. So there were plenty of ideas about how inheritance might have worked. The dominant one was one called blending inheritance. There the idea would be if you took a red flower and a white flower and you make them together, you'll get a blend of the two colours. You'll get pink flowers only. If you were to make the pinks together, you'll only get pinks because they're blending the colours together. What Mendel discovered was that's not how inheritance worked. And rather than being blending, this mixture of colours as it were, instead they are particulate. They're behaving as though they're particulate. Now let me explain a bit about what I mean. So go back to that pink flower case. So let's suppose we have a flower, in this case it's a snapdragon, and we have a red version. And what Mendel would have said is, okay, we have this red version, it's got two versions of, everybody's got two versions of the, a given gene, this has the same version in both cases. The pinks have got two versions, but they've got different versions, and the whites also have two versions, but they've got the same again. It's just not the same as the version that the red happens to have. If you mate a pink with a pink, what you will get, Mendel said, is not just pinks. So it's not blending inheritance. You will get one red to one white to two of the pinks in between. These things are segregating as though they were particles. So what, of course, we needed then, around 1900, was a name. What do we call these things? And it was into this context that this guy appeared. This is Wilhelm Johansson, who in 1909 coined the term gene. He was taking an idea that had currency at the time, the idea of a, a pan gene. This was a very particular hypothesis about how inheritance might work. And what he said is, actually, I like the gene part of this, gene from genesis, from origins for how things are, so let's strip off the pan part and leave ourselves with the gene part. What he said is this, therefore it appears simplest to isolate the last syllable gene, that's from pan gene, which alone is of interest to us. The word gene is completely free from any hypothesis. So it was a beautiful word because it relates to the Greek for origins and it also comes without any baggage associated. And the term stuck. So that's where we get the term gene from. It was to describe the underlying basis for those particles that are behaving in a Mendelian fashion. Now, naturally, people wanted to know, okay, if that's what a gene is, it's a segregating Mendelian particle. It's how information is transmitted from me to my offspring and from my offspring uh, down, and so on and so forth. This led to quite a lot of confusion because people were trying to stitch that understanding together with the molecular biology understanding. They were trying to make sense of how the two can work. But in reality, there are actually two logically distinct understandings of what a gene is. One concerns the molecular basis by which information in DNA is converted to how you look, what we call phenotype. And those are the molecular genetic ideas we saw already about DNA making a transcript, the transcript may be getting coded into protein. And the other is not about how DNA makes a phenotype, it's about how information is transmitted between generations. So why is it that I look like my parents and why my children look like me? And that is our Mendelian understanding of what a gene is, all to do with this particulate nature of inheritance. Now to clarify that these really are logically distinct sorts of ideas, let me consider this particular case history. Imagine what we've done is we found a mutation in a bit of DNA. So somewhere in my DNA, I've got two copies, I've got a mutation in one, making it different from the other. So I'm heterozygous at this bit of DNA. 
Now, let me imagine that what this does is have some very long-range effect on the transcription, maybe, of a gene miles away down the chromosome, maybe even on a completely other chromosome. We know these things can happen. Do I want to call the site in DNA where this mutation sits, do I want to call that a gene? Well, by the Mendelian understanding, absolutely yes. This will behave in a particulate fashion, and I'll be able to understand what progeny of mine would look like in terms of whether they have or have not inherited any version of the gene, just as we can understand whether you're red, pink, or white as a flower, without knowing anything about how red, pink, or white comes about. But notice, this bit of DNA is not transcribed. It's miles away from anything that is transcribed. Would we want to call this a molecular biological gene? No, absolutely not. So it doesn't fit our molecular biological understanding of a gene, but it does fit our Mendelian understanding of a gene. So they're logically different concepts. Often when we use the word gene, we actually mix up these two meanings in a very ambiguous way. And often that amb ambiguity is actually quite desirable. We actually don't want to be specific about which meaning exactly we are talking about. So we tend to be really quite sloppy. So let's ask the question, what could we mean when we talk about the gene for cystic fibrosis or the gene for breast cancer? Well, first off, we are being very sloppy. We do not mean that you have a gene whose function is to give you breast cancer or whose function is to give you cystic fibrosis. Not at all. What we actually mean is that we've found a bit of DNA that is transcribed and probably makes a protein, in the case of BRCA1, the, one of the major genes for breast cancer, for example. We have found the underlying DNA within which you get a transcript that gets translated, that makes a protein, and that is the sense in which we found a gene for BRCA1 in the molecular biological sense, in our first meaning. But we also mean something else. We also mean that somewhere within this gene, you can get mutations that will predispose you to having breast cancer. So that's to say there are mutations within the gene that will be transmitted just as the red, pink, and white flowers get transmit traits get transmitted, for example, in a Mendelian fashion. And so we have the second notion of a mutationally defined gene, a transmission defined gene. So we use the two understandings of a gene, how you make proteins, how you make phenotypes on the one hand, versus how information gets transmitted from one generation to the next, and why parents look like uh, their parents, and so on and so forth. And we use those and mash them commonly into our usage of the word gene. And it's not that we're lazy, it's just simply that actually it's quite a convenient ambiguity to mesh these two understandings together. So I hope that's helped you understand what we now think of when we talk about a gene, and thank you for watching.